everyone. Good afternoon to those who are here in Europe and uh, maybe those in the United States. Good morning. Uh, this is the second day of our uh, symposium called Religious Philosophy Between Humanism and uh, Post-Humanism. Uh, we have already had one day of proceedings yesterday and we are continuing uh, with, with the second uh, batch of talks today. Um, just to say, and maybe to repeat from yesterday, that this symposium is organized uh, jointly by um, Institute for Philosophical Studies of Science and Research Center in Koper, Slovenia, and the Faculty of uh, Theology and Religious Studies of University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And it is a part of a project, uh, Creatures, Humans, Robots, which is uh, centered at, at the Institute of Philosophical Studies. Uh, today, we will start our proceedings uh, with, uh, uh, with a contribution uh, from Todd Weir, who is uh, a professor at, at uh, the Faculty of uh, uh, Theology and Religious Studies here in Groningen, my colleague here, uh, who is also an historian of ideas, intellectual historian. So yesterday we had Karul Kersten from this sort of discipline or sub-discipline, and, uh, and uh, uh, today we have you, Todd. Uh, talk is entitled Monism plus Technological Advance is Transhuman Consciousness, a modern fantasy from Wilhelm Oswald to Elon Musk. Please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Gorod, for the invitation. I will try to look at the camera rather than the screen. Uh, anyway, thank you for the invitation. It's, it's, uh, it's fun to be in a, in a philosophical circle. Um, I like to work in, a, in an interdisciplinary fashion, uh, and especially with this topic that I'll talk about today, I think it's, it's uh, a good one for inter, inter um, disciplinary work. Um, so I'll just start off, you know, I think it's interesting with the phenomenon of transhumanism that uh, it, it's, it's, it seems to always be produced by uh, technological advance and by certain fantasies uh, that are derived in the field of science. Um, and um, of course, as a historian, I have to say that's just not new. So that's my intervention. This is not new. The thing that is so connected to the new and to the future is, in fact, not new at all. Uh, so I was inspired by, by Leonard uh, Schwoff's uh, talk yesterday, where he, he was um, investigating this uh, phenomenon of the future as something that reaches into the present, maybe as a kind of divine force, uh, the future reaching into the present. And um, so I think that this question of futuricity is really crucial to understanding the appeal of uh, transhumanism. And in my presentation, I'm going to make a connection to something I've studied, which is monism, uh, which is, a, I think, a transhumanist uh, philosophy or fantasy, if you so will. So I'm going to start my screen presentation. Um, let's see, share. Okay, can you see it? Yeah, okay. So you had the title of my, of my uh, talk. Uh, um, hopefully it will advance. No, not wants to. It doesn't want to advance. Okay. So, uh, what better place to start than with Elon Musk, right? I mean, if you think about uh, the philosopher king of Plato, I mean, today we have a philosopher billionaire uh, who's, uh, uh, I, I think, probably the most interesting of the new class of, of uh, multi-billionaires. Uh, he, he presents his entire work of enriching himself. Uh, as really a, I think, a, um, a utopian vision of the future. And I was listening to an interview uh, with, Mo with Musk, um, and uh, I was just amazed at, at his kind of uh, uh, ability to make himself the, the center of human history at the present. Um, and, uh, and I think there are elements of his kind of vision that match onto things I've looked at 100 year for 100 years ago, and I think uh, relate to our topic of transhumanism. So um, Musk presents a, a history, a, a present situation of the world where essentially we're trapped between ignorance and entropy, um, uh, the, these forces that are threatening to destroy um, the planet. So he, he sets out a number of disaster scenarios. Uh, there's a human disaster, climate change, um, or war, or the, uh, the AI taking over uh, and killing off the humans. Um, he talks about planetary disaster, uh, you know, the heat death of the planet. There's cold disaster, the, the, the cold death of the universe. 
Um, so all of these things in the future threaten to destroy everything. And what is required to save uh, humanity and the world is Elon Musk uh, and his work. So on the one hand, we have uh, a space exploration. Um, that it's necessary to transport the human species to other planets. Um, the whole quest for uh, changing the nature of the energy economy to electricity. Uh, and he's even interested in consciousness. He has a project uh, where they in they're inserting brain implants to increase our connectivity with the global uh, yeah, with the global internet, with global information. Uh, what's interesting about all of Musk's uh, projects is that the, the crucial element is time. Um, he believes that he is going to accelerate history uh, through his companies and that there's a race between the forces of entropy on the one hand and, uh, uh, well, yeah, there's a race against these forces. And uh, essentially, uh, his acceleration of time and of development through his technological innovations can save the world. And out of this emerges his curious, uh, um, uh, fierce opposition to uh, the lockdowns over COVID. And I was thinking about why he's so uh, animated and about the fact that uh, he should not be hemmed in by COVID lockdowns. And I think that what it comes down to ultimately is that he thinks that his race to accelerate history uh, is worth the couple hundred thousand dead uh, in the United States. Uh, it's really a means and uh, decision, and uh, his work is much more important than the lives of those old people. Um, I, I think that that's what it uh, came down to. And uh, the other thing in listening to, to uh, Musk is that I was, I was uh, it's, he sounded like somebody who was depressed, a little bit of bipolar um, element to the way he, he uh, you know, these kind of grandiose dreams and then the threat all the time of, of uh, uh, something intervening. And his really, uh, he wanted to end the interview as soon as the woman brought up COVID. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. So, you know, that, that's uh, to me, uh, um, uh, you know, Musk is this kind of quintessential figure of the present. Um, portrays himself as somebody who's already in the future. Uh, but it's not new to the extent that there have been other Musks in the past. And one of the most interesting is Wilhelm Ostwald. And he was a, a Nobel Prize winner in physical chemistry, German from, uh, from Eastern Europe, from, uh, from Riga. Um, and he was also fighting entropy uh, with his innovations. He came up with a theory that he called energetics, energetic. Uh, and this was uh, he left his own discipline of chemistry and went into another realm. And uh, he uh, had an imperative, uh, energetic imperative, don't waste energy, use it. Uh, and effectively, he, he thought that uh, there was, to, you, had to, you had to fight the tendency towards um, entropy by making more efficient use of the energy that's present. Um, and so there were, th there were these threats in the future, war, on the human scale, uh, planetary death on the on the um, on the scale of you know global energy, and uh, to sort of stave off these bad outcomes, uh, it required the intervention of technological um, giants uh, and scientific advance like, like himself. Um, and there's different elements to his energetics. One of them is that he had a, a unity of science project. So he believed that uh, one could think of orders of energy existing also in the different realms of the sciences. And here's his sort of pyramid of uh, the sciences. And at the top is of a, 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 a new discipline he called culturology. Um, so it's a, uh, yeah, it's a hierarchical pyramid of, of science. Um, he also believed in, in uh, technology that, that there would be technological advances uh, were going to um, uh, be crucial. So it's not enough to know uh, about the essence of the world. You also have to create technologies that allow you to move to it. And this is a book, Paths of Technology. Um, the third thing that he project had as part of energetics was uh, various forms to uh, change culture, the way that humans live together. Uh, he was a big advocate of artificial language and even uh, promoted his own artificial language. Well, it wasn't perhaps invented by him, but Edo, not Esperanto, but Edo. Uh, he was a pacifist. He was a big uh, promoter of standardization. So he developed the, for, the forerunner to the, to the A4 uh, letter. So he wanted to uh, uh, create the global standards because that would increase the efficiency um, of the global economy. So these are all practical uh, elements of his project. And then the last part is the philosophy 
philosophical dimension or the religious dimension, and that's monism. Um, Oswald was the president of the German Monist League. Here's their uh, poster, DMB, Deutsche Monist, Monistenbund, in 1911 till 1915. Um, and he believed that there was a unity of all existence uh, in, um, in energy, uh, so that energy uh, essentially was the single uh, coherent substance of the entire world, and everything was just manifestations of, the, of energy. And interesting, of course, is that this uh, philosophy came to him as a sort of vision. Uh, he describes a kind of, uh, uh, you know, a moment of tr inner transformation in 1890 when walking around uh, uh, Berlin, and uh, from that point on, it, it became a worldview, uh, energetics, monism for him, and he became a prophet of a worldview and effectively left work. Um, so monism is the topic. I've, I've, I've published a book on monism. Uh, of course, we think of Spinoza as uh, maybe the first monist. Uh, What's interesting, though, in terms of the connection to science and technology is that there's a moment of transformation in the middle of the 19th century because there had been many monist systems. You can even call Hegel a type of idealistic monism. But what happens in, around 1840 is that it shifts from an idealistic monism into a naturalistic monism as the predominant one. And interestingly, it's, it's Ludwig Feuerbach, we were already speaking about yesterday. Uh, uh, Feuerbach uh, has two children, let's say. One of them is a kind of humanism, a Marxian humanism. And on the other side, there's naturalistic monism. Uh, they both draw inspiration from uh, Feuerbach. And Feuerbach, of course, writes about nature and about uh, humanity in different ways. So I think that um, this naturalistic monism is a crucial worldview of the 19th century. And I think it's a transhuman uh, worldview. So what, uh, what indicates this shift? It's really changes in the natural sciences and the way the natural sciences operate in the public sphere. So we have, for instance, Cosmos of 1848 from Alexander von Humboldt. It, what Cosmos promises is, is a complete reduction of all natural science into a single volume. And the aim, he says, is worldview. Uh, so it's not, uh, it's not sort of minuscule scientific work. It's not an encyclopedia, but it's a condensation into a certain a single system that is also presented in a kind of aesthetic fashion. Um, that's uh, Humboldt. Uh, but Humboldt wasn't a, um, a materialist in the sense of others. So we also have a, a physiological reductionism uh, in the 1840s in, in, uh, in Germany. And there's the, the, the idea of the conservation of energy is very important. The universe becomes finite and uh, its, its contents become fixed. And there's a religious leader, you know, not important, Karl Schreder, Schreder in uh, 1850, who wrote, um, the infinite universe comprises everything that is, there is nothing beyond it, nothing can disappear from it, nor can even the smallest new thing come into it. It is the necessarily existent, the always there, always remaining, never subsiding or increasing, the infinite all in all. Um, so with um, this move into naturalistic monism, the idea of a kind of unified, naturally scientific explained cosmos is crucial. Um, by the way, uh, Gorach, when, give me five minutes. Whenever I need to end in five minutes, tell me, okay? Um, okay. We have materialism in the 18th 50s, which if you look at materialism, it's actually monism. Um, and, and Buchner later says uh, that he, his system is really monist, not materialist. Uh, what is the difference? Um, materialism uh, that includes thought and energy in the definition of material is monism. And that's the way that even in the title, Kraft und Stoff, Energy, Force and Matter, it already implies a kind of overcoming of dualism. Um, and a nice, a nice summary uh, is from Max Nordau, who was a physician and a kind of cultural critic, and he defines m monism as, as his, the new worldview. We consider the cosmos a mass of matter, which has the attribute of movement, essentially unitary. It reaches our perception in the form of various energies. That is our worldview. It penetrates us with the air that we breathe. It has become impossible to close oneself off to it. Uh, so this is is a, the uh, definition of a succinct definition of naturalistic worldview, monism. Right? And the, the crucial figure uh, is Ernst Haeckel, who's a biologist, who's known as the German Darwin. And he uh, here's a picture of Oswald and uh, Haeckel together uh, um, attacking a Protestant church. 
uh, in, uh, in a cartoon from the 1850s. Uh, Heckel was really uh, particularly, um, well, like, like Oswald, very concerned with being against the church, anti-clerical, and presenting monism as, as the new worldview. And here he was also known as the German Darwin because of his advocacy of evolution. And here he is presenting a present to Darwin on his 100th birthday, which is a halo. Um, so, of course, ironic. Um, Heckel uh, really embraced the notion of the consciousness of matter. Uh, it is known as Hylozoism, and he summarized this in his last big publication, which was called Crystal Souls, Studies of Inorganic Life. And in this book, he um, advocated that there was a, a soul potential in matter. So matter consisted not only of energy and, and well, energy and matter, substance also included soul, and that uh, the, that there's an evolution of soul that goes on in matter, and there's a the transition. Five, five between, minutes, Todd. Five minutes. Okay. The transition between the inorganic and organic matter is this, the crystal. So there's a striving of matter for uh, higher levels, and the substance then develops through um, from matter up through culture. Um, so where is this monism? It it is present in worldview. It, the future is a kind of idea of a transhuman consciousness. And the way to get there is uh, uh, through various steps. So the first step is to solve the so-called world riddles. And the world riddles were uh, uh, presented by Emile dubois Raymond, who said, mechanistic science has limits and it cannot go beyond certain riddles, such as the origin of consciousness, the origin of life, the origin of matter. Heckel said, no, 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 of course we can do it. Monist worldview provides the blueprint and science will deliver the answers. Uh, opposed, of course, by Stephen Jay Gould more recently. Um, but the, uh, the, the solving of the world riddles uh, was undertaken by some of Heckel's followers, uh, such as Paul Kammerer, who was famous for uh, uh, falsifying his evidence in order to prove the theory of uh, the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Uh, 1922, uh, he was, well, I think around 25, he was found out and committed suicide. Very sad story. Uh, but, but there's other um, steps that are needed to bring, go from this worldview, which is the promise of the future, to the transhuman future, and that is solving these scientific problems, creating a unified scientific understanding of everything, technological advances, social reform, and unrelenting war on religion. Um, and so here are some conclusions uh, that I thought were interesting. I think that this transhuman vision, which monism is, um, it really, it, it presents itself as something that is being driven by progress. Um, but in fact, it could really be approached from any angle. Uh, you can start with a vision, a religious vision, and move towards technological advance. Um, of course, technolo technological advances also may trigger fantasies uh, of this nature. Um, relating also to the talk of yesterday, time is absolutely crucial. Uh, science doesn't deliver, science doesn't just deliver the transhuman, it also achieves an acceleration to the vision. Uh, this sense of accelerated motion does two things. It promises to exceed the natural course of history, which produces progress, but also produces entropy. It provides the select few who are in the avant-garde space of technological philosophical advance, the exhilaration of being time travelers and heroes. So in other words, um, uh, this science, um, if you take Musk, for example, it's really crucial, I think, for the vision that you have somebody who is moving ahead of the, the time, who is himself a kind of avatar of the future in his technological work. And uh, the, the, this, this fantasy uh, resides in a, a, a select few who are these kind of time travelers. And we had the image yesterday of the, of the Mormon church as a kind of time machine. Um, there's something, of the dis there's a despair op optimism that's inherent in this vision. Um, the optimism comes from the conviction that nature pr produces transhuman consciousness. Okay, nature it tends to progress, tends towards these higher and higher levels of consciousness. But the despair accompanies it that this consciousness does not arrive before a catastrophe, which is war or entropy or uh, Donald Trump gets another four years in office or something. Um, the looming catastrophe uh, requires the intervention of the technological, scientific, spiritual avatars. 
so it, this is this is a kind of um, uh, I don't know what you want to call this. Uh, it's not a philosophical argument about uh, transhumanism. Uh, maybe it's a, it's a it's a has elements of sociology of knowledge uh, or uh, uh, a sort of um, thought experiment about uh, the. The component parts of, of a, a movement of self-selected elites uh, who believe that they are part of a, a, a future uh, plan, but they're actually, in many ways, just adherents of an old um, uh, philosophical vision, namely monism. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Todd. Now we have some time for questions. Um, about uh, nine minutes or maybe ten minutes. Uh, so I invite uh, our uh, uh, participants here on Zoom to ask questions, but also uh, our viewers on Facebook. Uh, Karul, I think I saw you were raising your hand, please. And Leonard? Yeah. No. Yes, thanks very much for this uh, thought. Uh, this is quite a revelation what I, what I heard here, especially what you said at the beginning, that uh, a lot of the things we talk about, and maybe that's... That, applies to the power to the speculative realists that this is nothing new because this whole notion of monism and especially what people like Hegel say about it, that's, that seems to resonate very strongly what accelerationists are, are all on about. But the, is there maybe a degree of, of unacknowledged influence there and may that have something to do with with the silos in which also philosophical thinking tends to be i mean i see speculative realists quote from the usual suspects from french continental philosophy but i'm, I'm starting to suspect that there's a sort of a lack of familiarity with uh, with german philosophy surprisingly in a way that this seems almost be ignored of un or unacknowledged I couldn't, I couldn't really answer that. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, certain moments recur, obviously, certain concerns. Um, and uh, I, I just, I think since the, let's say, the, the at the end of the 20th century, the decline of the political ideologies, a kind of crisis of postmodernism, there was a, a lot of postmodernist uh, thinkers um, I think moved back towards wanting to embrace a kind of uh, materialism of some sort, uh, root themselves again in matter. Uh, and they, many of them, I think, naturally gravitated towards a kind of monistic approach. Um, I, I don't know what the legacies are in terms of tracing them through. Uh, it would be, it's a very good question. And I, I simply don't have the, uh, the, the intellectual historical chops to, uh, <laughs> to answer that. <laughs> Now, it just tickled my curiosity, so it's, it's for sure something I'm going to follow up on, whether, you know, these people I'm now engaged with are as original as they pretend to be. <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting if you, I mean, probably reception also goes through oppositions. So, for instance, Max Weber is the most, uh, he attacked Oswald, absolutely, and really disliked Oswald. And if you look at somebody like Stephen Jay Gould, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, you know, really takes the stance of uh, Emile Dubois Raymond, uh, that there are riddles, right? Stephen Jay Gould says there are non-overlapping magisteria. Uh, science has to confine itself to the mechanical world, to mechanical explanations. And if it tries to move beyond it to, say, explain uh, the origin of consciousness or religious matters, uh, it will hype, it will inflate itself too much and it will explode or it will lose credibility. Uh, so I would think that if you looked at some of these controversies already from the 19th century, like between Heckel and de bois Raymond, you find Stephen Jay Gould fighting against the monists of his day, A.O. Wilson. So A.O. Wilson is somebody who says, I'm a, I'm a monist. Do you know A.O. Wilson? He's yeah. a, a biologist. Uh, so he, he's, he's one who says, I'm a monist. So people do use the term monism. Uh, or Michael Ruse, you know, the uh, philosopher of science, uh, these people, I'm sure, do know the, like, the heritage of yeah. this stuff. I think Deleuze used it also, huh? self-identified to a degree, or at least being Im an, an, a philosopher of imminence, which often strikes me as quite similar. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, okay. I found it very stimulating. So, so thanks for this. Sure. 
Uh, we can move on. Uh, Leonard, uh, you had a hand. Did you, Nadia, also raise a hand or did I? No. Okay, no, Leonard. Noreen, Noreen had her hand up. I saw it something. Noreen as well? I think Noreen wanted to say something. I, I got my uh, answer. Uh, Todd okay. just explained it, so I'm fine. Yeah, and John, I, I will not be so, uh, so uh, long. Uh, actually, you already answered in a way uh, I wanted to ask about this notion of monism. You know, how do you somehow uh are bit among these like uh, these thinkers like Hecker or Max Nordau are they really totally monist or were there some you know moments in which you could sense some more you know I would call this elemental freedom for example when when you you quote from Nordau and he says that we breathe the air air and so on you know so is this really a kind of complete monism or it just serves your your theory better, or are you referring to kind of a monism within the history of ideas that maybe it's not so much uh, present in philosophy as I, I would understand it? Could you just, in a few words, just elaborate on this? Um, sure. Um, I mean, what's interesting, I I look at because I'm a cultural historian, I, I am, I'm interested in the in the broad effects of philosophical movements rather than in the, the philosophical arguments. So proper philosophers tended to look at Heckel and laugh at him, right? Because his system had contradictions, it didn't make sense. Uh, and probably the same could be said of Nordau. These are not recognized as, you know, important philosophers, uh, but they had a big social impact uh, and a big impact in science. Uh, so I think they're worthy of being studied uh, for that reason. So I can't really answer the question about the, um, uh, you know, how, how pure their monism was, um, because I don't approach it from that side. I, I look at when they use the term and how they use the term. And I make that's the argument- good enough. Yeah, That's good enough. For me, this is, you know, a kind of a, a sign that, that it would be quite useful to read them. You know? <laughs> and and I, read them, I read them from the point of view of worldview. So my theory of worldview is that worldview is precisely the space between science, philosophy, and religion that is laughed at by all of the disciplines. Uh, so worldview is always criticized from any perspective, theology, uh, uh, history of science or scientific philosophy or proper, you know, uh, uh, whatever, uh, other, other philosophical traditions. Um, nonetheless, in, in the sort of operative space of, of cultural history, it's an absolutely central concept. And it really helps us understand the impact of something like monism. Just as if, if you look at Elon Musk's, the implica philosophical implications of what Elon Musk is doing, poss possibly one could laugh at his ideas philosophically, but he's, he strikes me as very, uh, uh, probably really worthy of study uh, uh, for this project. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So can I uh, go to Noreen now? Uh, Noreen, you have also had a hand raised, and maybe John? Yeah, in fact, uh, Todd just John ended up where... Todd just ended up where I wanted to go, which was to say that, you know, as a computer scientist and someone who spends time in technological circles, um, and this is sort of an answer to Karul, philosophy is laughed at. I mean, there, there really is a strong feeling that, um, that this is passe. Um, I know when I started moving into religion and science that, uh, central area that Todd was just saying is laughed at. I, I had colleagues who said, well, you cease to be a serious thinker. And I think we also see this in America right now in that there's a serious defunding of humanities departments, particularly philosophy departments. Many universities are closing their philosophy departments and all the money is going into what we call the STEM fields, science, technology, and mathematics. Uh, I also think among technologists and computer scientists, there's a very strong feeling that they want to be able to say what we are doing is new. And so to do what Todd just did and say this is not new goes precisely against um, what is the zeitgeist among uh, technologists right now. Thanks. So I think you're right, Todd. <laughs> I'm not, you know, I'm, I think you're right. Yeah, no, interesting. Okay. Uh, it's interesting, if you look at uh, Oswald himself, uh, uh, he left his, his field, he got a Nobel Prize in physical 
built chemistry. But effectively, when he when he came out as a as a monist in 1890, uh, his colleagues stopped taking him seriously, and he had to move into other realms to engage in his philosophical ideas, which was uh, really he became a public intellectual, a, a kind of prophet of worldview, uh, and he became president of this association of monists. Um, yeah. So uh, it's interesting that. The, the, the kind of worldview position also replicates itself in the, in the, in the career uh, choices of monists. Uh, so they end up precisely in that space between the disciplines. Okay, Todd, I think uh, if we do, we have another question here, very brief one. Uh, if not, we're going to move on. Uh, but I, but uh, yes, because we also have one comment from Facebook, which I would just like to read. I think it's interesting. Um, so uh, Reza Akbari uh, from Iran, he, he wrote, uh, the concept of monism in this sense is very interesting for me as a person who knows Islamic philosophy. Many Muslim philosophers are somehow in this school talking about existence as the one and only one reality. Con consequently, they say everything has consciousness. Uh, including sand, leaf, water. It seems the difference is that they put monism in a different framework using, for example, energy or existence. Uh, so an observation, whether you want to comment it or not, but uh, this is an interesting observation from Islamic philosophy point of view. Yeah, no, I, I don't think I have uh, any specific comment. I mean, it's, it is interesting. The monists, of course, are interested in other world religions uh, as having a, an affinity to, to monist thought. Um, if you look uh, at, or in the 20th century, um, uh, uh, what's his name, Aldous Huxley and Christopher Isherwood, who are the kind of English people who really create the new age in California, the, the, the philosophical underpinnings, um, they publish a book called Vedanta for the Western Age. And, um, and I think that uh, Aldous Huxley says that Vedanta is a monism that's fully compatible with Western science and spirituality. Uh, so th there's an example of some monists, European monists, um, using another religion um, to try to uh, ar argue for ancient roots to monist philosophy. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, okay, Todd, I want to thank you very much. Uh, it was Thanks. a very interesting contribution. Uh, so I will now actually uh, let Leonard chair a little bit because I'm the next speaker so that I don't uh, uh, <laughs> announce myself. This just sounds very wrong. So Leonard, please uh, take over and uh, I come back as a speaker in a few seconds. Thank you. Todd. Yeah. yeah. Thanks uh, also from my side for this interesting uh, lecture. So uh, we are uh, now at our lecture from uh, our colleague, Gora Sandrej, assistant professor at the University of Groningen, and as well as researcher at our institute in Koper. And I'm really you know, glad to, to, to be able to announce him now. His paper is uh, titled, Can Humanism Be Reformed? A Wittgensteinian Response to Posthumanism. So it is quite uh, in line with his you know, uh, thinking in philosophy of religion, Wittgensteinian thinking and so on and so on. So please go to your 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Leonard. Uh, I will, um, I, let me just uh, check whether, because I need to change my screens in order that I will have my text, uh, that I will look in the camera, uh, still looking at you while reading rather than looking at the upper screen, which is slightly unsocial. I hope you will agree with me. So I need to rearrange things a little bit. Um, so uh, I don't have a presentation. I will simply uh, try to talk, uh, read maybe a few things, but uh, uh, want to present to you a certain kind of response to posthumanism, which I think uh, I think uh, maybe is already being given in in a, a rather fragmented form by by uh, some philosophers and others. Uh, but I think it deserves a kind of a clearer formulation, maybe a, a larger. Um, uh, you know, uh, formulation than it has had. And this is really my uh, attempt, but of course this is going to be a short uh, presentation uh, of it. Now I just realized I keep looking up at you in, in the screen. So this is not really working as I thought. Let me, <laughs> let me try to do something else. Uh, make things slightly closer. Your, that, is, that means your faces and text slightly closer. And let's, let's, let's do it like that. Okay, so, 
Uh, first, uh, I would say that humanism, uh, I, I think is in, you know, in many respects, very unlike a scientific theory or, or something like an explanation of, of the world. Uh, um, and I also think some kind of humanism uh, constitutes a part of the most basic and normative framework for our ethical and political thinking and action for most of us, uh, you know, uh, even if not consistent, even if not even sort of co conscious or just semi-conscious, even if problematic. Uh, and uh, despite the, the fact that, that we can talk about many versions or variants of humanism that are incompatible maybe, still uh, it, it is this kind of sort of normative framework often working really at the, in the background that, that we can understand humanism as. And I, uh, this, this would be my first sort of uh, disclaimer of how I want to approach humanism. Um, you know, scientific theories uh, normally do not have such a basic regulatory role in our lives. And if they do, they become maybe something else as scientific theories are. Um, maybe Todd would say worldview, but I will, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> we can talk about the worldview in this, in this sense. Um, but for this reason, it is very difficult, if not impossible, for many to consider humanism from the outside, so to speak, to assess it critically with some uh, distance, which is, after all, what philosophy, you know, tries to do very often. So um, post-humanism, as I see it, is an attempt to do that and to help us, the readers, do that. And it's an attempt to do more than that. But this is one of the important things of so how to look uh, at humanism critically and somehow from the outside as much as possible. And I think both critical post-humanists uh, do that. And they are in a majority among post-humanists uh, that do this. Uh, from Donna Haraway, with, you know, the veteran post-humanist in this respect, and then Catherine Hales, uh, Rosie Bredotti, uh, Carrie Wolf, and, and others. Uh, but also speculative post-humanists, and uh, especially I've been reading David Roden among those, uh, and I've been impressed with his project. Uh, so, uh, when asking or facing critical questions about humanism, one must choose, in a way, between uh, three kinds of response, uh, you know, defense or reform, either mild or deep or big reform, or some kind of rejection or abandonment of humanism and then replacement uh, by another large scale stance, perspective or framework. In my case, post-humanist literature really helped me to realize that I am after all a humanist, <laughs> but uh, in a way that I want to uh, be a humanist or committed to humanism, or even I would say defend it which I think most of the time is not needed. Most contexts do not call for defense of humanism. Uh, mostly this would be in you know, either uh, discussion with other uh, scholars, philosophers, or religious studies scholars, maybe sometimes conversation maybe with an artist or, uh, or techno enthusiast. Uh, but vast majority of situations in everyday dealings uh, you know, with my fellow human beings, also in my dealings with animals and things, uh, there is no need to defend humanism. That's, I think, one of the important points here. Um, but as the title suggests, uh, I think Wittgenstein's philosophy do does give a good idea of, for a formulation of humanism uh, when it is being reflected upon in, in this kind of context that, that, that I've mentioned. Uh, of course, not only Wittgenstein, I mean, uh, there are plenty of other philosophical sort of material here that can be used and I also am in, informed with. Um, and in this short time, there is going to be very little actually that I will say uh, that, that can be included. Uh, so I will start with, uh, with uh, a few critical points that post-humanists make. Uh, I will only focus on critical post-humanism. Um, and then and then proceed to, to formulations of humanism that I think makes sense. Uh, so Catherine Hales in, in her book, How We Become, Became Post-Human, uh, claims many things. And one of the things, one of the points she makes is that the category of human is sort of historically, uh, historically specific construction, she writes. Um, and she really combines, uh, we could say, Deridian and 
uh, embodied cognitive scientific uh, critique or critiques uh, that she aims at a uh, liberal human subject at the center of humanism in her view. So her attacks of, on humanism is really on the conception of a, of a subject that she feels is a, uh, is a central or, or somehow indistinguishable from humanism. Um, liberal, it's a liberal uh, conception. Uh, she argues that there is nothing like, you know, the autonomous and unified subject or self that freely and autonomously decides, uh, cognizes, uh, controls things. Um, all these processes are material and distributed between biological bodies, our biological bodies, and also uh, animals uh, in some cases, and artifacts that we use. Uh, and in the past, those artifacts have mostly stayed outside of our bodies, but with modern technology, they are also increasingly inside or combined, you know, under our skin. Uh, which doesn't really matter for Hales because she, is, she reminds us that skin is an arbitrary boundary between us as subjects and the world. And this is just another really misguided humanist construct for Catherine Hales. Uh, furthermore, and this especially in her more, more recent book, uh, she emphasizes that most of our cognition is subconscious or unconscious below the radar of human awareness, which of course goes against a certain kind of optimistic view of that human conscious thinking is a necessary part of our cognition and so on, which is not really very revolutionary point, but she puts a very strong emphasis on this, that our bodies combined with artifacts really cognize all the time and the most of the cognition is happening in this way. <clears throat> So the essence of humanism for Hales is the misguided construct of the autonomous liberal subject that kind of is not aware of, of how really this works. And important part of her project of the center in the human is her claim that human cognition can no longer be regarded as sort of a norm uh, or you know, a standard uh, against which all other cognition can be measured, uh, technical and non-human. Uh, and uh, this is a kind of her attack uh, on humanism by branding it also anthropocent anthropocentric, mean, meaning that human cognition is somehow superior to other kinds of cognition and it's a kind of a measuring rod by, by which we are measuring uh, other possible or real cognizers. And then Hales also, you know, she has the moral and political points in there as well and says that our need to control and master our environment, which is also part of an enlightenment humanist project uh, in the broader sense, should really diminish in light of our post-human awareness of our interdependency and sort of en enmeshment with our environment. Uh, I should also say about Hales's post-humanism that I am quite sympathetic uh, to her critique of the erasure of embodiment in in, in you know, many features of Western thought, uh, in old, some of the old parts of formulations of humanism like Cartesian uh, humanism and dualism and a focus on the rational thinking self as the defining feature of humanity. And both also, and also in <clears throat> old cybernetics, uh, you know, Turing and, and Wiener and so on, and the more recent uh, transhumanism that they are very much, uh, uh, formulating what is the, the crucial thing about human mind uh, in you know, computational way and uh, erase, they kind of erase the, 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 the embodied part of it or, or de-emphasize it as an important uh, feature. But, but I will leave this, this be at the moment. I should also say about post-humanism that most variants, not only Catherine Hales' post-humanism, criticize humanism for its anthropocentrism, an, an, anthropocentrism. So this is a very important, I think, feature of critical post-humanism. Uh, humanism is seen as irreparably anthropocentric, unable to avoid, uh, avoid it and unable to value non-human beings, uh, either biological or technological, in a non-instrumental way. So it's, it would seem that humanism only gives human beings intrinsic value and upholds some kind of superiority of humans over all other human beings, if that is a kind of a, a 
approximate definition of uh, of anthropocentrism. And you know, one one thinker who really emphasizes this a lot is Rosie Baidotti. Uh, she also emphasizes that humanism is first and foremost a political project. I mean, this is almost, uh, uh, I mean, this should be obvious in some sense. And it is a kind of a normative convention, by Dr. says, by virtue of which many humans themselves are discriminated against or, or excluded. So by Dr. says, humanism already operates with a certain notion of humanity, which is kind of modeled on Western uh, white uh, man and his culturally specific way of defining reason. And then many, many humans themselves are marginalized, uh, uh, women, people of color, uh, you know, lower classes, uh, uh, also often LGBTI community and so on. And this marginalization for Berdotti goes uh, together with uh, a marginalization of non-human uh, beings or uh, you know, if if certain particular kind of humanity and its use of capacities of reason uh, is a measuring rod, uh, also then uh, animals and and uh, technological uh, uh, objects or beings are compared to. <clears throat> so, okay, so this is just a few words about. Uh, Post-humanisms and its critique of humanism that I think are were worth picking up, pick, picking out for this uh, presentation. Now, first, I would do a partial general response that is not yet uh, based on Wittgenstein's philosophy, and that would be, I think, critical post-humanism often does not appreciate the diversity within humanism. Uh, there are very different kinds of humanism, and also there are different kinds of anthropocentrism. And, uh, and uh, David Roden, who is also a post-humanist, but of a different kind, speculative post-humanist, <clears throat> he points that out and really analyzes it very well. Uh, so, uh, you know, there are, uh, there is a Cartesian humanism, we might say, which is uh, committed to certain metaphysical picture, uh, uh, you know, thinking, cognizing self as opposed to the non-thinking extensive matter. And then there is slightly different transcendental humanism uh, of Kant, uh, where still humans are in certain sense, you know, transcend nature and determinist um, way of that, that the world operates. Um, uh, so kind of outside nature in a sense in the space of reason and there is a free will there that, that helps us, <clears throat> you know, determine our action and, and so on. But there is also, there is a Christian humanism uh, you know, uh, we could talk about Thomistic humanism of sorts, or, you know, uh, Piccolo de Mirandola and, and thinkers like that in history of Christianity have also been humanist in a particular way, as well as anthropocentrist. <laughs> but there are different kinds of, uh, of humanism and other religious humanisms are also different. There are also Marxist humanism, there is also secular humanism that distinguishes itself from religious <clears throat> worldviews and so on. So, the point really is that critique of Cartesian humanism, for example, is not necessarily relevant for transcendental humanism or Christian humanism or a Marxist humanism. Uh, so also characterizing humanism as first and foremost an uncritical affirmation of autonomous liberal subject or Cartesian subject seems um, almost like an unfair argumentative tactic. So you define humanism in particular way, which is easy to knock down in a way and critique and uh, maybe not allow humanism's other expressions to really, uh, um, you know, be taken on board. And in the name of that critique already abandoning humanism, which I would say is too quick. And then there is a question, also general question, is humanism anthropocentric? <clears throat> and also David Roden himself also says, well, not necessarily. So. Uh, humanism, uh, Rodin actually has a very nice definition of humanism and anthropocentrism, which, uh, which works for me as well. Uh, he says, philosopher is a humanist if she believes that humans are importantly distinct from non-humans and supports this distinctiveness claim with some kind of philosophical anthropology. So it is about the distinctiveness of humankind and not necessarily including some kind of superiority claims. Whereas, next, humanist philosophy is anthropocentric if it accords humans a superlative status 
you know, some kind of superiority <clears throat> that all or most non-humans lack. So one can be humanist, but not anthropocentric. And this, this should be sort of obvious, but it's often not in the post critical post-humanist uh, discourse. In addition to that, uh, I think it's also uh, well to, uh, I mean, it's good to have in mind that there are different degrees of anthropocentrism, anthropocentrism uh, and different kinds of anthropocentrism. So there might be very mild forms of saying, you know, humans are more important or, you know, humans are superior in a certain sense, but they are not superior in most other senses in the, you know, big scheme of things. <clears throat> so all these distinctions actually are important for an intelligent and fair debate of humanism and its, uh, uh, supposed anthropocentrism. Now, uh, to bring in Wittgenstein, and this is now sort of the last part. Uh, how many minutes do I have? I hope I can. Okay, thank you very much. So we can, I think, start to get the grip of Wittgensteinian humanism as a stance, uh, not really in response to post-humanism first, but in response to the claims of radical difference between cultures and religions, for example, uh, and in particular between Western uh, science and reason-driven culture uh, on one hand and the so-called primitive cultures, uh, you know, that are driven by superstition and more primitive religions on the other hand. And because this was the very frequently repeated claim and the view in Wittgenstein's time among uh, anthropologists and, and, and other uh, uh, humanities and social scientists. For Wittgenstein, due to the instinctive origins of communication, uh, culturally specific concepts in different languages can nevertheless very often be translated with enough contextual uh, you know, interpretation and so on. So in philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein writes, uh, you know, he sets the scene that we come to some kind of island, a strange island we have never been, we find a tribe there uh, and uh, then uh, how do we understand what is happening when these people communicate among one another? And we actually happen to understand. So these missionaries and early anthropologists, they did uh, figure out quite quickly what were, the or what were orders, uh, what were just telling stories, what were jokes and so on. So Wittgenstein would say the common behavior of mankind is the system of reference by means which we interpret the unknown language. So it is a certain common behavior of humankind, I would say humankind, corrected the gender language here that Wittgenstein uses, and our instinctive sort of reactions, uh, you know, instinctive recognition of approximately what is going on, which then enables uh, translation and intercultural communication. And also in another work or uh, collection of remarks on Fraser of Fraser's golden bow, Wittgenstein also formulates a commitment to sort of morally salient commonalities of humankind. And they are really in certain uh, uh, instinctive reactions that he, as he called them, that we tend to have towards each other and also towards death, towards the sick, uh, grieving uh, people in pain and so on. And this uh, in Wittgenstein's picture crucially informs our concept of humanity and also influences <clears throat> most of the basic rituals and symbols that human cultures have developed throughout the world. So such rituals and symbols that are shot through with sort of the instinctive can be found uh, practically everywhere in Wittgenstein's view. Uh, and he says, you know, ancient rites that uh, anthropologists of religion are studying um, they, uh, you, you, uh, this is like a use of an extremely developed gesture language, he says. So it, the gesture, the, there is a gestural origins of language and of religion in a different way, which enables our understanding across cultures of these phenomena. So this is a kind of a common spirit of humankind that Wittgenstein says. We could, we could call this a kind of a bottom-up humanism, so to speak, not uh, we define a sort of a universal reason and go sort of top down or we define freedom as a defining feature and then go kind of define it top down. Because on reason, just a few words I would say, so um, Jane Hill has a very good, ar a very good article in my view, uh, uh, back to the rough ground, Wittgensteinian reflections on rationality and reason, where he says, well, the concept of reason should be in Wittgenstein understood with a small r and he does not have much to say about reason in general. 
and this is for good reasons. <laughs> um, so uh, it would be, you know, reason comes out of reason given practices of communicating, uh, communicative practices of persuading each other. And that's also a kind of a bottom up notion of reason that comes out from human uh, communication and our reactions to one another, our social life and so on. And then finally, maybe I would say, so uh, philosopher Raymond Gaeta, Australian philosopher in his book, Common Huma Humanity, develops a sort of Wittgensteinian humanism in which the human suffering or mutually recognizable life of emotions and felt responses, typical felt, you know, range of responses to one another, uh, play the role of what makes us human in, in, in Gaeta's view. And I think what is then important to add here is that this is not a human beings are biological homo sapiens. Rather, uh, although sort of, you know, our bodily predispositions and uh, characteristics, of course, crucially influence how we um, experience one another and what we would call also sort of a species recognition, uh, in philosophy, <clears throat> some people would call it like that. Uh, the body has a lot to do with it, but there is no there is no ne necessary relations that it has to be completely biological body like human body is. Rather, I say would we would uh, we would uh, try to assess or try to kind of the responses if there would be a technological or technological or uh, you know radically augmented. Uh, being uh, like a post-human of certain kinds, it would be from these reactions whether we could regard such a being as part of our community of humans or part of a moral community more broadly. So, so for, uh, yeah, I, I realize over. Yeah. I, I realize the time is over, so I'm now uh, bringing this to 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 a conclusion. Uh, so my 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 final point would be. Uh, I think I'm not an anthropocentrist, but rather instead of anthropocentrism, what I would argue would be a permissible kind of bias towards humans would be a certain kind of love towards humanity, which is not based on, on you know, uh, rational ethics, uh, broadly speaking. So I think the way we should uh, seed our inclination to human solidarity above the solidarity with other beings, either technological or biological, is by likening it to love, which is kind of partial, and you can be aware of it that it is kind of biased, but, but it's nevertheless can be a commitment of hope, you see. So <clears throat> on one hand, we have the instinctive roots of humanism, and on the other hand, we have this sort of unfinished project of humanism to really uh, become fully inclusive and so on, and which is uh, then could be linked with uh, such kind of biased love. Sorry, so this is it. I have to I had to bring it uh, to a close rather briefly now at the end. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your lecture. Now we have uh, some time uh, for questions. Who would like to begin, Noreen? Konstantin Gasper. Okay, Noreen. Yeah, I was interested, uh, Gerez, that most of the posthumanists that you quoted, particularly at the beginning of your talk, were women. And yeah. that their critique of humanism was that it was anthropocentric and had a tendency to instrumentalize nature. And yet, the posthumanists that I encounter as someone in artificial intelligence are men and their view tends, I think, to be even more marginalizing than humanism in the sense that they take, I think, what I think of as a very masculine view of reason and a very instrumentalizing view, not just of nature, but even of human beings themselves. And so instead of the broadening out that I think you were seeing among female post-humanists, I see an even further narrowing in to a very masculine view of reason and a very instrumentalist stance. You know, for example, you see this in Kurzweil, in Musk, you know, um, Bostrom, all of these. Um, so 
I'm wondering if you, if we ha are not seeing here uh, a very, two very different post-humanisms, one coming from women yeah. writers and one coming from ma male writers. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting that most transhumanists are men and <laughs> most critical posthumanists are women. Um, and, you know, critical posthumanism has this connection with feminist thought, which is a kind of a strong connection with a feminist critique of society and so on. Uh, so it is a, almost, you know, it's a kind of a natural contingency that most critical posthumanists are women. And uh, I can't really comment on on the fact that most transhumanists are men. I haven't almost have I even mentioned I haven't even mentioned transhumanists here because I think they are not my main concern. I also agree with uh, the posthumanist critique of transhumanism for the most part. I mean, the, <clears throat> maybe I'm not that uh, negative about seeing you know human being as a uh, as an information processing system and you know with a feedback loop and so on it it, it can we can be seen like that so it is possible to to see hum, human brain as a big computer but it is not only that and i think the problem becomes when we say this is what is most important about humanity or this is even distinctive about humanity but transhumanists are not really saying that they are saying machines can do that as well uh, you know therefore we can think about uh, migration of, of 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 consciousness to other <clears throat> to other materials uh, that are not biological and so on um, so yeah. the I, I would say we can simply ex I would I would accept a lot of or most of post-humanist critique of transhumanism as a certain kind of bias or blindness for the importance of our embodiment I would I would uh, stay with that. Uh, okay, Constantine. Thank you, thank you so much for this talk. And there's a number of things I wanted to ask, but I'll just ask one. And following on from Noreen's point, which I think is is really insightful. So, so it, it, I, I think it seems right that uh, most of the the men writing on this are far more impressed by. AI than than by animals, whereas most of the yeah. women writing about this are far more impressed by animals than by humans, um, let alone um, AI. And and I I wanted to sort of ask a related question. In this second realm, Wittgenstein is quite contested grounds um, be, because he's quite ambivalent. Um, um, in, 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 with animals, um, depending on which remarks you read and which translation yeah. of them. And there's a view that, so Anscombe, just, despite being a woman, was, was very much on the sort of anti-animal side of this debate. And her translation of, of Wittgenstein in certain places is, is contentious. Yeah. And I don't know if you know the Von Savigny article. So so the common behavior of mankind is one of these contentious translations where um, von Savigny thinks it should be something like shared behavior. Um, and whether we call it humankind or mankind is yeah, not no. here the issue, but shared behavior where that means that there's not one universal common behavior that all humans, but that there are shared behaviors um, within communities. So when you do your anthropology kind of remarks that you spoke about, or the, you know, we enter the alien planet or whatever, what yeah, we're yeah. looking for is not one common behavior, but behavior shared. And I wondered, yeah, on your views on this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sec this second point first, uh, of course, common does not mean in 100% shared right it is shared to a large degree and also shared in some very unusual difference in how it comes out and plays out and uh, you know a conceptual difference are huge and uh, you know ritualistic and other cultural difference i think wittgenstein's philosophy give does not give us license to simplify and think away those differences at all and in this sense it is much more uh, you know, sensitive to difference, this kind of humanism, let's, let's call it still. Uh, so yes, it is a shared 
uh, shared uh, features of humankind and then you can see which ones are you know which ones Wittgenstein is impressed by when he reads Fraser and and others right um, and we can be impressed by because it is interesting when we encounter culture we have never encountered and has had maybe you know limited contact at least in the past with our culture and then we see certain you know, there is music, there is there is ritual, there is jokes, there is this and that, and we are we are kind of you know there, we should allow ourselves to be stricken in wonder by these uh, sh shared features, and there are also unshared features. But I think on this on the first uh, question, animals, yes, I think yes, some of the remarks, the lion, famous lion remark, <laughs> that you know we wouldn't understand uh, lion even if he spoke, right? Uh, is I think uh, I think they are problem problematic in some sense, or they are you know, the, or they are focusing on on human on distinctiveness of human language with its own st structure that it tends to have. It's not the Chomskyan view of language, of course, but it still uh, it still says you know certain kind of structure symbolic communication seems to Wittgenstein to distinguish us from animals. I would say. Well, at least in some of the remarks, mm. you you would disagree constantly. But I would I would just say, the, uh, uh, you know, on the other hand, of course, many kind of uh, emotional reactions to the world and to each other, and some at least basic emotions uh, are shared between us and other biological human beings. Of course, there are they are. So this commonality and you know, in a way, uh, uh, community in some sense, a community that goes beyond humanity is 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 a reality from a Wittgensteinian point of view. It's not something we should you should deny. It's not like these are automatons and we have souls and we are so much more wonderful than than animals. I don't see it in that way. Uh, but I don't know what would you think about the language uh, or as a distinguishing. So do do I have time? I don't want to take questions. No, from I would like to give a. I would like to read one comment from Facebook or question, and then maybe okay. Gasper will decide if he yeah. needs to answer his last question. We are already kind of in a coffee break, but we can I know. take two or three minutes, you know. So the question from Facebook is uh, by Java Taheri, our, uh, our PhD student that we both know with uh, Goras very well. He mm -hmm. says, Question for Gorast, what has been argued in cognitive science is that our understanding is basically embodied. Without image schemata that are rooted in our body, we do not have cognition. Don't you think that cognitive science account is compatible with Wittgensteinian response to posthumanism when he says we cannot go beyond of the binds of language or grammar? Commonalities comes from instinctive aspects in humans. Do you think that instinct can be preserved in a post-human status of post-human nature? It's quite a complex, but yes. No, I, I will. I will try to be short. I, yes, I, of course. Uh, I I do think that uh, what cognitive science tells us about uh, our you know cognition and embodied cognition and so on. And I'm very much prone to agree with more embodied schools of cognition is compatible with, with Wittgensteinian humanism that I wanted to formulate in this, in this talk. Um, but that does not, of course, mean that Wittgenstein was a cognitive scientist. Of course not. So we, as a philosopher uh, that likes both cognitive science and some of the things that we really understand about humanity from, uh, from, from this field of science and what we get from Wittgenstein, one has to combine and there is a lot of uh, potential and not only potential people have done this uh, a lot of possibility to to combine to combine the two or in mutually inform these two discourses yeah. between these two discourses uh, okay. but i will leave it at yeah. that i think yeah okay. there were there were other things in the question but i think we don't have time no uh, no thanks yeah. uh, Gaspar, will you? Uh, I, I think we are really late on time, so I will okay. not uh, waste uh, any more time. Okay. Now, I will just say one word. I, I think uh, just very short comment, like uh, because I wanted to add to Javad's question is just that, that yes, yeah, this approaches, uh, especially Wittgenstein, I think it is very compatible with uh, the approaches which don't see subjectification as value laden, but uh, something that is, we could say, uh, transcendental. So, uh, as to speak, and it, I think in this approach, this is actually very, uh, very close to what, what you wanted to show us with the Wittgenstein approach in 
comparison to traditional humanist uh, humanist approaches. But I, I think we really don't have time, so I, I think we should have a break right now because okay. we are ten minutes late. Okay. Yeah. So we have a fifteen minutes break now, uh, and we meet at uh, like five minutes to half past four. Yeah, like fifteen twenty-five. Yeah. 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 If, yeah, if Polona, I hope also agrees. She, uh, Polona this is, uh, is next yeah, speaker. This is yeah. a, a five minute change to our uh, schedule. Yeah. So, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. I agree. Good idea. I just. Um... Uh, we are starting with the with the next uh, next lecture. Uh, I hope everybody is ready. Uh, I want to introduce our speaker, uh, Polona Tratnik. She is uh, an aestheticist, a philosopher of aesthetics, also um, uh, active in, in the art world, I understand, Polona, or uh, still today, or, or was in the past. Uh, and uh, she has uh, worked uh, in, in uh, uh, topics that are related to this project from, from a different perspective, maybe, than, than others. Uh, her, I will just uh, announce your talk, Polona. It's called Vampiroteutic Sublime, and I'm very interested to hear it. Please. Thank you, Goras. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, first of all, thank you for organizing this event. Yes, I believe um, I'm going to contribute something uh, a little bit different than, or, or maybe not. So I'm curious about the response. Actually, I refer to the book by Willem Plusser, Vampiro Theotis Infernalis, which is considered as a half uh, fictitious science, so to say, where he's discussing Vampiro Theotis Infernalis. And he wrote in a letter to his friend, Dora Ferreira de Silva, dated January 29th in 1981. He wrote, please let me tell you of the project that moves me at the moment. 20 or 30 years ago, a giant cephalopod was fished out of Pacific waters of difficult taxonomic classification among the octopi and the capots, which received the name Vampiroteutis infernalis, end of quote. Lucer did not have very precise information about this animal. So compared to the giant squid, which can reach up to 13 meters in length, the vampire squid is a significantly smaller creature. The beast, as Flusser called it, inhabits the lightless abyss between 600 to 900 meters. While Flusser might have known that the vampire squid belongs to the class cephalopod, he most likely did not know that the vampire squid is not actually a squid. Physiognomy is important here. The inner side of the arms and tentacles are, of the giant squid are covered with suction cups, while the vampire squid had suckers only on the distal half of the arms. In order to conserve energy when attacked, the vampire squid raises its glow-tipped tipped tentacles above its head as a way to divert the attacker away from its central body areas. A terrifying sight to behold if one follows Flusser's lead and imagines an enormous vampire squid of the size, the size of its 13 meter long giant cousin. So Flusser was equally interested in the vampire squid and its aquatic environment because for him, I quote, environments are just as much mirrors of the organism as the organism is a mirror of the environment. End of quote. Playfully inter, inver, inverting religiously tinged, tinged, tinged spatial metaphors of high and low, Flusser situates the vampire squid at the very bottom of the ocean. And here is a very nice quote that I want to, to read to you because you will get a picture uh, about uh, his observations. The lowest level, the bentos, is the ultimate destination of all life on earth. It is there where all vital energy generated by plankton goes and where all fertilizing cadavers go. The organisms that inhabit the bentos, such as walking, swimming, and digging animals, form the final link in the chain of life that encircles the planet. There are no plants in this region, only animals that are similar to plants. 
and vampirotheotic dominates this region. He is the Lord of all life. So this is the vampirotheotian environment, his habitat, the center of the world, the great hole that sucks in all of life. It is permanently vivified by the mana rain, which falls constantly. It is eternal night illuminated by the living rays em emanated by the living creatures, end of quote. So you can get this idea that it's pretty, it's kind of fantastic imaginary. Only the Vampiroteutis Infernalis can inhabit the abyss. Humans would perish in its dark, desolate, desolate environment. Flusser lays out three hypothetical interpretations of the vampire squid's habitat. So this is his main concern. How can we approach this animal. The first depicts this inhuman vampiroteutic paradise, reptile with red, yellow, and silver crabs, and a garden of delights that whispers, shines, and dances. The other two interpretations are unquestionably human. According to the second interpretation, those of us who see in the abyss a cold black hole under a crushing pressure, full of fear and turmoil, inhabited by vicious and repugnant creatures that eat each other with pinkers and teeth, we would simply call it hell. The final interpretation attempts to adhere to the ideological confines of the so-called objective science. Nevertheless, nonetheless, Flusser, the author, doesn't endorse any one interpretation. In Hegelian fashion, Flusser's own interpretation strives for the Aufhebung, sublation, of the established concepts of the species, which all comprise the environment in which the species lives. While he respects the vampire squid and its inhuman umwelt, Flusser still imagines the creature as an impossibly powerful alien thing. In this regard, Pompeiroteutis Infernalis and the greatness of its abyss unfold this sublime. So this is my thesis that actually we can find Flusser's perspective as, um, as um, comprehending the Pompeiroteutis Infernalis in its sublimity. An early 20th century zoologist and biosemiotician Jakob von Uxil poses the idea of the Umwelt as the perceptual environment of a particular being. In the Umwelt, the world and the animal are existentially linked in a perceptually embodied circuit. For the animal, the carriers of characteristics or significance are everything in its environment that, is, that it perceives as interesting or stimulating. So for instance, a tick is drawn to warm-blooded animals. An animal has receptive organs that perceive the mark, German Merkorgan, and react to it, Virkorgan. So the tick gets into a functional circle as a subject and the mammal as its object. If one would exchange the hard, small tick with a soft, giant squid, one can easily imagine that the squid would have an interest in the ship in the same way the tick is interested in the mammal. The squid would take the ship as an object in its umwelt. As we know, this fairy tales and tales about giant squids that suck down the ships into the bottom of the sea. So it would suck on it with the numerous suckers on its tentacles, eventually dragging it down into its abyssal world. So according to von Uixil, there is no practical or theoretical way in which even physically proximate animals share the same perceptual environment. Instead, there is only a forest for a woodcutter, a forest for a botanic, a forest for a wanderer, etc. The animals, however, operate within their respective umbels. The bee, the tick, and the fly that we observe neither move in the same world nor share the same world with us, the observers. 
So the vampire squid and human don't live in the same habitat. From this perspective, we don't share the same world. Flusser was aware of the impossibility of their meeting. That would sublate the subject object relationship and that would mean a meeting of existence with existence. I quote Flusser here. It is difficult for us to catch vampiroteutis in nets for fishing as well as those for knowledge. Both of us live separated by an abyss. The atmospheric pressure that he inhabits would crush us and the air we breathe would suffocate him. If we manage to incarcerate his relative in aquariums in order to study them, they tend to commit suicide, devouring their own te tentacles but we are ignorant of our own behavior should we manage to drag us to the deep and incarcerate us under his glass domes in order to observe us." End of quote. We literally live in different worlds, Flusser concluded, which also explains why he was so fascinated by the vampire squid. There is no general world or, or objective universe which is common to both, he writes. Such abstract world of science does not exist. If we find Vampiroteutis, it is within our own world that we find him. We do not find him as existence, but as object. In Heideggerian terms, this kind of existential difference means that for both of our beings in the world, no mutual embrace could ever alter the fact that we are two separate creatures with two fundamentally different perceptual apparatuses and umwelt. As Flusser puts it, I quote, every attempt to transform Ampyroteutis into a human complement is a betrayal of human existence, a dangerous romanticism. It is pointless to try to minimalize this. Ampyroteutis is our hell. End of quote. With the Umwelt, the world that we don't share, Vampiroteutis is condemned forever to the realm of the other or the human. Here we are confronted with the impossibility of these two species meeting in any manner other than in a subject object relationship, which is a relationship of subordination, be it from the human or from the animal's perspective. It is no coincidence that Flusser and Heidegger both drew upon von Uexel theory, which corresponds so well with that of Kant. Von Uexel believed that subjects and objects were interconnected in the, the Umwelt. And what makes his theory so novel is that it connects biology with Kant's philosophy by emphasizing the decisive role of the perceiving subject, in part because there can be no time and no space without a living subject. For the human then, there can be no other concept of empiroteutis than the one conceptualized by the human. So how can the human subject judge empiroteutis and its abyss? With the concept of the dynamically sublime, Immanuel Kant reflected upon nature as power. He defined power as a capacity that is superior to great obstacles. It is called force, Gewalt in German, or domination. If it is also able to overcome the resistance of something that itself possesses power. I quote, nature cons considered in aesthetic judgment as power that has no domination over us is dynamically sublime, end of quote. The aesthetic judgment of the sublime is essentially related to relations of power. When Kant enumerated the cases from nature, such as the threatening cliffs, thunderclouds, volcanoes with their all destroying violence, hurricanes, etc., he concluded that, I quote, the sight of them only becomes all the more attractive the more fearful it is, as long as we find ourselves 
ourselves in safety, end of quote. According to Kant, this takes place because we, I quote, discover within ourselves a capacity for resistance of quite another kind, which gives us the courage to measure ourselves against the apparent all powerfulness of nature, end of quote. So therefore, as Kant continued, this analysis of the sublime as ascribed to power seemed to run counter to the imagined representation of God as exhibiting himself in anger in the forms of thunder, storm, earthquakes, etc. Furthermore, it would seem sacrilegious if we were then to imagine that we had any superiority over the effects of such power. In submitting to religion generally, it seems that adoration with both hat, remorseful and anxious gestures and voice are the only appropriate codes of conduct in the presence of God. Therefore, Kant concludes, I quote, sublimity is not contained in anything in nature, but only in our mind, insofar as we can become conscious of being superior to nature within us, and thus also to nature outside us, insofar as it influences us." End of quote. So therefore, we can actually connect this conceptualization with the ancient tales, fairy tales, in old sea tales, it was common, it, if not narrative, narratively necessary for the human characters to not only measure themselves against their superhuman creaturely attackers, but to find ways of resisting and outwitting them too. Usually the battle comes down brains versus brawn with the brainy humans almost, almost almost always outsmarting the beast. So the production and circulation of these tales were modes of understanding the unknown and horrible dark world, a world perhaps full of beasts and monsters, perhaps not, a way of overcoming in our collective mind the resistance of something that possesses power and a way of establishing man's domination over that something so existentially horrible, which also meant overcoming man's own fears. For Flusser, however, the objective was not to resist or to defeat the squid, the beast, as here in this case, for instance, but to discover it, as he says discovers it in a manner different from the objective science. In Flusser's word, words, to discover the vampire squid, we first need to get used to the unusual, end of quote. As we stare into the abyss, the alien and terrifying creatures we see, it turns out are just our human projections. Although today, the deep sea squids and their abyss are not the horrible immensity man is to be afraid of, we still have not sublated the gap between the worlds of the species and the impossibility of their meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Polona. Very interesting uh, reading that you had for us. Uh, I haven't read Flusser's uh, work, but I looked it up a little bit when uh, you know you sent me the title of your lecture, and uh, it is indeed interesting as a kind of a special kind of encounter between humanity and a species that is very foreign, and reflection on that. If I may start with a question, John, I will give you a word very quickly. I, I'll just have one short question. So, <clears throat> Polona, I think the main idea that you present or Flutzer presents is this sort of radical otherness that we sort of see in this vampire squid or saw in the empire squid, which in a way that it's, you know, the kind of a relationship is impossible outside of projection and this kind of horrific thing from hell and so on, objectification in this way. 
and you know it then performs certain functions for us that is not really its function in some sense. I, I was I want to maybe just ask because it seems science is almost irrelevant here, but I think maybe because you know vampire squid is something that we could now watch documentaries about I don't know in the last ten years. And there have been these cameras going down to the, those areas of the ocean that are actually very dark where this vampire squid lives. And then they discover that it's not, uh, you know, uh, how to say, a predatory being. It's not, uh, it's actually harmless for us, right? So in some sense, to my mind, that would say, aha, uh -huh, science actually and investigation, although it's so objectifying and everything actually helped us to build a different relationship and different imaginary picture of this being. So it did inform this sort of deeper, you know what I mean, perception where we form a certain affective relationship of it. Would you, mm -hmm. what do you think about that? Would that be against what Flusser says? Because now at the end, actually you went into this direction. It's not that horrific as we, perceive it i'm sorry it's not i don't know whether it's a good question thank you just... thank you i think you made a good point i would just say that um he flusser is engaged in this concept of this radical otherness and he's engaged in that but his objective is not to repeat that position actually he wants to go over hmm. it to, to somehow find something else find another way of approaching something that wouldn't be a way of objective science therefore this mm -hmm way of writing and the whole work that he does is a kind of um, unique it's not uh, it's neither science neither uh, literature and so i think it has to do with the um, knowledge that we have um, you said maybe it's not so uh, relevant but it was relevant that therefore i i started with that that uh, he didn't have precise knowledge about the vampire squid so there was a lot of um, connotations, uh, vampire, hell, and so forth. But he imagined, he said, the beast, so something giant, uh, whereas this was not. He also thought that this animal lives much deeper than it actually lives. Mm. Uh, however, later investigations, for instance, uh, confirmed that um, split, so to say, this uh, abyss that is between this species uh, it, it's very relevant to consider all the species in their environments, in the hab habitat. Uh, yep. So th this habitat is the one, I mean, therefore he takes an animal that is so distant and so unapproachable that we cannot embrace. I mean, he, he is using these terms that also help to imagine that. So we cannot embrace this animal. If we see it, we see it as an object, even if it's studied by a science. So that would again be, be a kind of object objectification. So we um, we don't we don't really come in in connection in uh, in real communication. So um, it's interesting that uh, later on they were able to to catch the giant squid in the aquarium to 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 keep it in the aquarium, whereas the vampire squid is not. Um, is not an animal that would live in um, captivation, so would not survive. Uh, so, which again, then you know, uh, emphasizes this point that it lives in another, in another world. So, I'm, I'm uh, in this paper. I'm trying to. I mean, I'm actually coming to a conclusion that um, that Flusser is actually, a, in a way, repeating or. Um, it's in a way insisting in this uh, position, um, which is um, which is the position in which he he observes the sublimity of this animal, so that uh, he preserves this this um, images of uh, of the horrible but the nice support of mm -hmm. something that is endless, and I mean in many many uh, features uh, he preserves this notion of the sublime in how he comprehends the, the squid and as you said if the if science uh, helped uh, with this demystification of the animal sure i mean sure so that was the basic reason why it was so much demystified so these tales that were told about the giant octopus or squid or um, some beast 
or monsters from the sea, or maybe some lakes, or for instance, here we have in Slovenia, Valvazor was writing about um, dragons from the, from the hills, from the mountains. Uh, he was observing the Proteus, this human fish. For instance, people believe that these were the animal dra dragons uh, juvenile. So yeah. it has to do with, uh, with the lack of knowledge, for sure. So, yeah. But the other question is, uh, what does this um, reach, so re reaching of the, I mean, if we enrich this capacity of knowledge, um, I mean, do, are we still able to preserve this uh, richness of the perspectives that, for instance, we can still find in Tusa? Because I yeah. think we, we are losing that. Okay, let's let's have, because we have other questions, Polona, uh, I think John had a question. Uh, if yes, you can um, come in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very convinced by the analysis of sublimity, although it's interesting that the sublime is typically from a height, of course, but you're talking about sublime from the depth, which is interesting. But I also wanted to ask about science and, and gender because the, the book is co-authored with uh, Louis Beck. And I've never understood if he even exists. Is is this a real person? Be, be, because sure. it's so it's so confused. Um, and I'm I'm very convinced that it really is, you know, that the question of the scientific facticity of the squid is completely secondary to that allegorizing um, impulse. But um, so it's a fantasy, it's a fable, it's a horror story. But the thing that strikes me is this is about pornography. I mean, when you read it, it's animal pornography and the, the way that they talk about the animals eating each other in coitus or the way that sex and death are inverted or the way that they celebrate the squid's triple penis. Yeah, and I, I'm, I guess I'm just asking about, because this seems like this is to pick up a previous theme, an example of masculinist animal studies, as opposed to a kind of feminist mm -hmm. animal studies. And I just wondered um, what you thought of that. Thank you, especially for this last remark. I wasn't really aware of this uh, dimensions that I think uh, could be further studied and interesting, they're interesting. Um, as regards Louis Beck, he was a very good friend of William Fusser and he died, I think, last year or two, two years ago. Uh, so he, because Fusser, Fusser died in 90, the end of uh, 80s or beginning of the 90s in a car uh, accident where at, uh, uh, Louis Beck was still active. And Louis, Louis Beck is actually was a scientist. He was a scientist and he was working in a rather strict uh, scientific mode, not precisely, but uh, rather strict uh, scientific mode. Um, and what is also interesting is that uh, Louis Beck was also uh, um, took part in a project that uh, Eduardo Katz did with uh, GFP Bani, which was um, um, biotechnological, one of the first biotechnological art projects where he inserted this uh, green fluorescent uh, protein into a rabbit and address the genetically modified organism. So Louis Beck was uh, collaborating in that project. So he was uh, actually pretty much involved. He, I would, we were even together in a, in a, at a conference and uh, he was also very much uh, interested in philosophical perspectives too, but he didn't really write philosophical text. So therefore, therefore this, uh, this text uh, as regards its uh, philosophical perspectives, I think, uh, would be authored by Willem Fusser. Thank you very much, uh, Polona. Uh, I think we are probably, we have time for one short uh, comment maybe or question, but uh, uh, you know, we are approaching the time. We only have one minute. So uh, we can also draw this to a close. If, if, uh, if nobody has a burning question, then we will move on. Thank you so much for this Thanks. interesting lecture. Uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Noreen Herzfeld um, from St. John's University in Minnesota. Uh, Noreen, uh, what's the time at your at your place? It's now slightly later in the morning. Mic microphone, please. It's almost nine o'clock. Nine o'clock in the morning. Okay. So <laughs> the sun is up finally. <laughs> sun, is, sun is up. This is a good thing. <laughs> we will see you better. Uh, so your talk is titled uh, Surrogate or Tool? How Autonomous Do We Want AI to Be? So please. 
Okay, you can go to the next slide then. Um, so the title of my talk is Surrogate Partner or Tool. And the question that I'm interested in is basically the question of agency uh, for artificial intelligence. Um, and first of all, there have been some philosophers who have suggested that technology has a sort of agency of its own. So here I have two quotations. The first from Jacques Ellul, technology is a power endowed with its own peculiar force. It refracts in its own specific sense, the wills which will make use of it and the ends proposed for it. Or we have Neil Postman who says, we've engaged in a deification of technology which means that the culture seeks its authorization in technology, finds its satisfactions in technology and takes its orders from technology. New technologies alter the structure of our interests, the things we think about. They alter the character of our symbols, the things we think with, and they alter the nature of community, the arena in which thoughts develop. For these two thinkers, the agency that is held by technology is a diffuse sort of agency. It's, it's in a way a secondary agency in that technology works on us. And then we, in a sense, alter our behavior or alter our way of being in the world through the force of technology. What I would like to examine today, however, is a more direct sense of agency. In other words, as we look towards a post-human or a transhuman future in which AI figures, will our computers have a more direct kind of agency rather than this diffuse secondary form of agency that Alul and Postman speak of? Next slide, please. Uh, so, in the past, our technologies, our tools have merely been amplifiers of human capabilities. So, you know, the hammer amplifies the force of our hand, the microscope, the power of our eye, you know, our transportation technologies amplify uh, our ability to move rather than simply depending on our feet. Next slide. But the question is, what about the computer? Is the computer categorically different from other tools? Uh, back in the 60s, two men who both worked at Stanford took very different approaches to the question of the computer um, and came up with two different terms. So first you have John McCarthy who coined the term artificial intelligence and he saw the computer um, as having an intelligence of its own, which in a sense would give it an agency of its own. This is very different than the view of Douglas Engelbart, who most of you might know as the inventor of the computer mouse. And he coined the term intelligence augmentation. For Engelbart, the computer remained very strongly within the category of human tools as simply something that would augment one of our powers, in this case, the power of our intelligence. John McCarthy believed that it stepped out of that augmentation uh, type and became in the sense a very new sort of tool. Next slide. So here's our question. Um, are computers more than tools? Are they, we know that in many ways they serve as an augmentation. Um, so I have there the example of the spreadsheet, you know, which doesn't do anything that human accountants don't do. Um, it just does it in a different way. Mostly it augments the speed, uh, maybe you would say the precision of accounting. But then as we move towards, for example, Alexa, Siri, we would say, are our computers becoming more than tools, more than just augmenting something that we already do? They, do they add something? new? Do they have a sort of agency of their own? Next slide. So our computers agents, an agent has internal choice. And this internal choice derives from mental states. Here we have two different philosophers, East Coast of America and the West Coast of America, uh, Daniel Dennett, 
who has suggested that there's no reason why computers can't be agents, that human internal choice arises from our mental states, that our mental states simply arise from the patterns of our neurons, and that we could someday replicate these patterns in a computer, the computer could have the same sort of internal choice. Um, John Searle um, is very famous for his Chinese room problem in which he said, any choices that our computers as we know them today seem to be showing uh, aren't really coming from them. They're coming from the programming that they were given uh, even though the computer seems to show some understanding, it has no internal understanding, therefore no internal choice. Uh, next slide. So, um, first, computers as tools. What about partners? And here we have the question, as computers move into being in the human realm, can computers be moral agents? You know, we could say, well, they have a certain amount of agency. If you ask Alexa a question, she gives an answer. Um, what about being a moral agent? Uh, Michael and Susan Anderson have said that to be a moral agent, you need four things. That you are not under external direct control. That you interact with the environment in a deliberate way. That you fulfill a social role. And that you're cognizant of the responsibility inherent in that role. If we look at computer caregivers, we find the first three are fine. They're not under external direct control. They interact with the environment in a seemingly deliberate way, fulfilling a social role, but we do not have yet number four. We don't have a caregiver that is cognizant of the responsibility inherent in that role. So at this point, um, the Andersons would say that the computers are not moral agents. They do not meet all of these criteria. Next slide. However, what about surrogates? In other words, what about doing moral, what we would call moral actions without cognizance? Um, here you have the computer, uh, either as a partner or as a surrogate, it need not be cognizant of its uh, agency or of its social role to still be engaged in acts that have moral consequences. And so I'd like to end by taking a quick look at lethal autonomous weapons. So here we have a picture of the Aegis autonomous weapons system um, being launched. Um, and this is a large naval weapon system used by a number of countries around the world. Next slide, please. However, um, when we think of autonomous weapon systems, we think about missiles, we think about big systems, probably the more ubiquitous and the more frightening, uh, but the much more desired, at least by the United States military, uh, would be something like these. This is the Cargo 2. It's a, a small drone system capable of facial recognition and of carrying a lethal payload and capable of acting in swarms. And so here we have a quote from one of our Marine colonels, James Jenkins. We want lethal autonomous weapons to be small, smart, cheap, and abundant rather than exquisite and expensive. Next slide, please. Uh, so here they are, coming soon, the new weapons of warfare. Next slide. Now, obviously, lethal autonomous weapons are sought after by uh, militaries around the world for their benefits. Uh, here are just six of the most obvious. They can process vast amounts of data at speeds and levels of precision beyond what we can do. They can make rapid decisions in the changing circumstances of battle, operate in harsh and difficult environments. They're a lot cheaper than human troops. They work long hours without tiring. They could carry out orders with fewer mistakes and they keep soldiers out of physically and psychologically dangerous or deadly environments. 
Next slide. Do they make warfare more or less just? There's disagreement on this. Uh, Professor Ron Arkin of Georgia Tech suggests that lethal autonomous weapons could make warfare more just. He focuses on how human soldiers commit war atrocities and has suggested that precisely because lethal autonomous weapons would carry out orders more precisely, they would make warfare more just in that they would not act out of fear, they would not act out of revenge, out of the emotions that soldiers experience on the battlefield. Major General Roger Lati Robert Latif, uh, with whom I'm collaborating on a paper right now, disagrees with this. Next slide. He believes that lethal autonomous weapons are a moral Rubicon for the 21st century, much in the way that the advent of flight was a moral Rubicon for the 20th century. What flight did was it took soldiers physically out of the battlefield. We could now bomb from a safe distance up in the air. What lethal autonomous weapons do, which is different from drones, for example, is they take soldiers psychologically out of the battlefield. They no longer have to make the immediate decisions that bring uh, the havoc of warfare. So while the 20th century took them physically away, the 21st century is taking warfare psychologically away from the soldier. Next slide. So here are four questions that I think we need to ask. I am just going to present the questions. Um, and, uh, you know, if we want to go into any of them in further detail in the questions, we can. One question for each of the categories of just war theory. So use ad bellum, when to go to war. Would fully autonomous weapons make war too easy and painless and mean that war would no longer be the last resort? Use in bellum, how to fight the war. Would AI's lack of human emotions make it less likely to commit atrocities as Arkin says, or would it make it an implacable foe? Use post bellum, who do you hold responsible for acts of warfare after the war? Can you hold a machine responsible for an act that was committed? Can you hold its programmers responsible? Does the responsibility ultimately go to who launches it? Or have we so diffused the responsibility that no one is responsible? And finally, use ad vim, uh, short of warfare, we know, at, certainly in America, that any weapon that is held by the military very soon trickles down to the police. Do we want especially to see these drones that I showed you coming to a police force near you soon? Next slide. Okay, quite some time ago at a famous lunch at Los Alamos Labs, the physicist Fermi asked the question, if there are so many planets that have so many um, possibilities of life, where is everybody? Why have we not yet heard from technologically advanced civilization? And here we have Drake's equation, which puts forth all of the different parameters for their being, uh, for our hearing from another technologically advanced civilization. Fermi suggested, and Neil Bostrom has uh, also built on this question, that somewhere there is a great filter. Now, this filter could be early on. Perhaps life does not uh, arise on very many planets. The filter could also be later on. And uh, as Bostrom has said, let us hope that the filter is early on and there simply isn't life on many planets because if there is, the filter is later on. Next slide, please. And that means that there is probably a technological bottleneck uh, to modify an old Amish saying 
we grow too soon powerful and too late smart. In other words, evolution of our morals, evolution of our way of thinking and being in the world does not move at the speed that our technology moves. And this could probably be the case on multiple planets. If evolution works in the same way, and there's no reason to think that it wouldn't, then it is probably the case that our moral evolution does not keep pace with our technological evolution. And uh, in a way, this brings us back to our very first talk with Karul, uh, when he talked about this question of, you know, do we, is there an end? Uh, is it going to be when the sun goes nova? Well, it may come a lot sooner and we may bring it about ourselves. Um, I think the first doomsday weapon that we had was nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are very difficult to build. If we go back to the Cargo 2, the Cargo 2 is cheap, easy to build. We may have a new technological potential bottleneck. Well, that's kind of a downer to end on, but there we are. We'll end it there and uh, move to discussion. Thank you very much. I will now uh, switch off the screen sharing, just a second. Uh, thank you, Noreen, for this very interesting lecture, uh, also sort of intriguing. Um, I would uh, invite questions now, please. Uh, also, people on Facebook uh, who are following, your, do ask in chat. Uh, Polona, I think, had a hand uh, first. Please, Polona. Uh, Karul, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this lecture. I think, um, I mean, I find it interesting also because I deal with the concept of an apparatus. And uh, before I, I, I discussed Willem Prusser's theory and he's known for his theory of uh, apparatus, he's linking it to, uh, to photo, to camera, to photographic camera. I don't know if you're familiar with that one, with that work and this concept. No, so uh, I mean, just shortly to, to say what he's saying, then I would uh, um, uh, elaborate on the question. So he's, uh, he's uh, differentiating three categories. He says, one are the tools. These are the prolongation of uh, humans, which reach into the world in order to change it, to transform it somehow. So it's work invested in that. So then we have a concept of a machine the difference is both of them, the machines and the tools, reach into the world and change it, and they do some work. Whereas machine is an autonomous agent, if you want. So it's something that works <laughs> autonomously, whereas the tool is something that is a prolongation of man. But the category of the apparatus is completely different, he says. This is a category that belongs to a post-industrial society. And uh, what it does is it produces information. So it changes the meanings. It doesn't change the world and doesn't do the work, but uh, produces new meanings. So information, it's the society of information therefore. So I think this concept of apparatus might be useful he says that the relation of the man, of man with the tools is that the tool is a prolongation of man. The machine is autonomous, but uh, man could be attached, is attached to a machine, but is um, um, replaceable. So this is corresponding to industrial society. But in apparatus, a man is actually involved uh, in the apparatus in the way that he says this is a functionary is a functionary of the apparatus. So there are there is a program, each apparatus has a program. And um, what the man does in apparatus is it realizes one of the options of this program. So, um, but what I'm interested in uh, relation to your lecture, uh, so if you considered about the notions of apparatus and the machine, there is one, uh, I think, interesting, uh, uh, addressing of this notion comes by Levi Bryant. He's uh, part of this triple O uh, group. 
object-oriented uh, philosophy. Uh, so he's uh, reconsidering the notion of a machine quite differently than this, uh, so to say, according to this Marxist, Marxist uh, uh, philosophy. But uh, you, you also came out with the question of responsibility or the question of power in relation to, um, to the artificial intelligence. And I was uh, just recently discussing the case of a Facebook as an algorithmic program, a kind of an apparatus that uh, gets us in and so involves us. Flusser believed that the power is- Sorry, Polona, can you, yeah, can you please move to the, the question? Because we have, sure, yeah. Sure, sure. So Flusser said that the power is in the hands of the programmers because the programmer is the one who makes the program and can change it and so forth. I would say when you were uh, asking this question, who is responsible in the case if you have artificial intelligence robots or forth, uh, wouldn't you agree that it's, it's in a way simple so that it's only that um, the question of responsibility is then transmitted to the owners of these technological systems? Not necessarily. I mean, right now we would say certainly responsibility, um, you know, of, of any act of warfare is to the person who deploys the weapon. Um, the problem with autonomous weapons is that they may make choices or decisions that were not anticipated by either the programmer or the person who deploys it. And at that point, I think you run into the question of whether, uh, I mean, first of all, the, the programmer can, can say, you know, I, I just programmed it. Uh, the person who deploys it can, uh, I think, plausibly make the argument that uh, if the weapon is able to choose when and where to fire, in other words, if it can choose its own target, the person who deploys it can say, I did not choose that target. I would not have chosen that target. Then they could try to push the responsibility back on the programmer, but the programmer can basically say, well, I didn't choose that specific target. I only gave it, you know, these parameters. Um, and yet, and ultimately then you have to ask the question, can you say that the machine is responsible, but can a machine have moral responsibility. Um, it diffuses the responsibility, which is, I think is something that all of our machines do. Thank you, Noreen. Um, Karul, you had a question, right? Um, maybe more an observation because you brought your talk around uh, uh, Noreen and connected it with, uh, with the preoccupation I had yesterday with extinction and mm -hmm. dissipation. Um, but there is actually another connection much more concrete in that sense is that what you described about all these uh, techniques of warfare. Uh, something I didn't talk about yesterday is that in the first book, Cyclonopedia of Reza Negarastani, which, as I said, is a work of theory fiction, that very much of the plot of that book actually revolves around um, this notion of the war machine. So not so much mm. specific techniques or pieces of equipment, but this Deleuzian notion of war machine, mm -hmm. um, which he illustrates in the book with creating a, well, it, it's, it's, that's where the political zamizdat comes in, I think. Mm -hmm. um, illustrates with that nexus between petroeconomics and, and, and the Wahhabi Salafi Jihad doctrine. Creates a very menacing and dark picture and, and even the manipulation on the background by this uh, special forces and insurgency expert, a fictive character called Ra Randolph West, which to my mind is a combination of Lovecraft's uh, Randolph Carter character and Colonel Kurtz in Apocalypse Now or The Heart of mm -hmm. Darkness. It becomes indeed very concrete and touching on, on, on the more specific operational aspects you touched on. But mm -hmm. it struck me indeed that aside from the abstract connections that uh, in a more anonymous way, maybe even than the operators of this technology, it, it, it features so prominently in the well, outright menacing picture that that the mm -hmm. book Cyclonopedia paints of our future. 
it was so it was more an observation actually sorry yeah. couldn't resist it's very interesting i'll have to i'll have to get that book thank you thank you karul also uh what was, was there another question here uh from the participants. Uh, I, I have a short question, Noreen. Uh, it seems to me, and maybe it links also to what Karul has said, that uh, the main worry is still, you know, who is going to be responsible, right? And then we are we are operating, or you, I think, Noreen, are operating with a fairly standard uh, humanist, maybe liberal notion that there is there are human subjects then that can only be ultimately responsible or should be ultimately responsible. The problem is machine probably cannot or should not be allowed to take responsibility. It's not that kind of a system, not, not that kind of an intelligence that can do that, uh, right? So the worry is ethical, basically. It's ethical worry, not mm -hmm. kind of you know ontological somewhere independently of ethics. Uh, so would you say that there is behind the, the, your final point, there is this um, very much humanist ethical uh, uh, point, really, uh, argument or, or assumptions at least? Oh, perhaps I didn't make it clear, but um, if you think back to the slide of the robot caregiver and the question yeah. there was that, can the computer be a moral agent and the problem is that anything that we have right now, and this is certainly certainly our lethal autonomous weapons right now, are not cognizant of their decisions. They are not cognizant of their responsibilities or their social role. My feeling is that without that cognizance, then what you have is something um, that cannot be held responsible. Yeah. So, you know, ultimately, and, and because I was speaking of these weapons in the present, I mean, we've got these things, all right? This is not in some future that we're trying, some transhumanist future we're trying to imagine, we've got these things. They are not moral agents in the sense that the Andersons would talk about a moral agent because they lack that cognizance. And yet they are making decisions that have very strong moral implications. Sure. And this is where the question of responsibility becomes very difficult to assign. Of course. Because without cognizance, you cannot assign it to the machine, and yet the humans can let themselves off the hook by saying the machine made the ultimate decision. Yeah. So, so but, but the cognizance means a moral uh, discernment, right? It doesn't mean uh -huh. cognition. Cognition, of course, machines do have in some sense. Would you say that? It depends. Well, yeah, in, in a sense, I guess you can say they have a type of cognition. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what they do not have is consciousness. Yeah. Okay. This is a big question <laughs> yeah. that you have just opened. Last question comes from Facebook, uh, from uh, our PhD student, uh, Javad. Uh, he says, my question for Noreen. Uh, do you not think that autonomy or some other features like agency, mental state, and morality are just features of intelligent organic creatures like humans, which can grow and develop independently? And AR examples are in their ultimate realizations, uh, or they should uh, turn to high intelligent organisms. I guess I read it right. In this case, AI cannot be autonomous in a real sense. I guess it's more or less similar that we what we have just been discussing you have already addressed uh, he raises uh, another really large question that we were just moving into with the question of consciousness and that is is consciousness as as we understand it coterminous with biological life or is it possible to have consciousness outside of biological life so far we have only seen biological examples of consciousness, which, which includes, you know, Polona's creature. Um, in fact, all of life seems to exist on a continuum of consciousness. So far, we see a type of cognition in machines, but no consciousness. Sure. Whereas, of course, the philosophical question is whether in principle there could be machines with consciousness. That's what usually 
discussion is about. But what I think Noreen, you are saying is empirically speaking, what we, have, what we, are, what we are experiencing now, we have no sign that, right. that machines, the highest machines have consciousness. Um, I think we should draw this to a close. Thank you very much, Noreen, for uh, wrapping up our sy symposium with this talk. Uh, it was sort of frighteningly concrete and uh, brought us to <laughs> you know, ponder upon actual uh, dynamics of, 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 of warfare uh, today and the deployment of, of uh, AI systems in that, uh, which is, I think, a good way for us to concretize some of the uh, questions that we had uh, earlier in the symposium. Um, I would want to thank everybody for your uh, not only cooperation, your contributions uh, for questions. Uh, I think it was quite interesting to see very various perspectives and sort of limits to humanity that we've been discussing uh, under different concepts like inhuman in Karul's case, uh, you know, things, uh, uh, non-human, post-human. Uh, uh, I think, you know, let, we will leave it uh, and ponder upon the connections between these topics. And I'm sure that uh, in our next uh, event, which will come in, in next year, uh, we could continue some of these conversations and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Gasper, do you have anything to say at the end uh, in terms of tech? No? Nothing special. I would just like uh, to thank again everyone for the patience uh, due to the issues we had first day. And I hope that today, for most part, everything uh, went along perfectly. People were there on Facebook. And I think the, the uh, symposium has uh, or will get the recognition it deserves, uh, especially for the organizer. And I would just like to, I need to say one thing. I would like to actually thank, uh, sincerely thank, uh, Dr. Gorest Andrej, because he put a lot of work into this and uh, he really deserves recognition at the end, as well as, of course, Dr. Linushkov and all the rest uh, who helped with the, with the symposium. So this is silent claps. Okay. This is so lovely to see. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gasper, uh, and, and everybody else. So if there is nothing else to say, um, uh, you know, greetings to wherever you are and have a good weekend and also bye-bye uh, to all our viewers on Facebook. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Nice to meet Bye. you all. Bye. Bye. Lovely group. Great. Hopefully next time we meet in person. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs>